So today we're going to continue our introduction to plate tectonics, which turns out to be central not just to understanding why the oceans look the way they do, and also it gives us insight into the history of the continents, it turns out. And it, in general, is a major unifying theory, not just for oceanography, for, but for all of the Earth sciences. And it's a, actually an ongoing question in the planetary sciences. Every time we send a mission to Mars or to Venus, one of the questions that gets asked is, you know, can we find evidence of plate tectonics on these other planets? Which actually goes along with the idea of whether or not there have been oceans or life on those planets as well. All right, so last week we learned that uh, the basic shape of the surface of the Earth could be explained, at least the, for the most part, in terms of flotation or buoyancy of the rigid uppermost parts of the Earth, the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle is cold. Those are rigid. They float, however, on a solid but plastic hotter region of the mantle called the asthenosphere. And the continental crust floats high, essentially. The top is high at or above sea level for the most part because it's relatively less dense and relatively thick, whereas the oceanic crust and lithosphere is relatively thin and more dense, and therefore the top of it floats a little bit lower in the asthenosphere. So the oceans naturally tend to accumulate over that low-lying part of the Earth. And the next question that comes to mind then is, you know, why is that happening? Why, when we look at a map of the elevation of the Earth's surface and the depth of the Earth's oceans, like we see here, do we see this fundamental dichotomy? And, and why are there these second-order features like mid-ocean ridges and deep sea trenches. Why isn't it all in the ocean, in particular, just flat abyssal plain? Okay. Right at the end of Friday's lecture, I started talking a little bit about Alfred Wegener's work. This is his picture from an exploration in Greenland. And he sort of, he went through what we expect a scientist to do. He had observed these phenomena, particularly of the boundaries of the continents matching up across the Atlantic Ocean. And he had tried to come up with an explanation for why that might happen, that in the past those continents had been joined together and had over the course of geological time, over something like 200 or 250 million years, moved apart, creating an Atlantic Ocean where there used to be one supercontinent. And this was based not just on an observation of matching of outlines of continents, as had been observed actually going back even before Wagner, but also in more detail, matching up of distributions of fossils, matching up of the roots of ancient mountain belts, many geological features that are an age something like 200 and 250 million years or older, seem to go across the boundaries from one continent to another as if they had used to be right next to each other. They didn't seem to realize that there were thousands of kilometers of ocean in the modern world between, for instance, South America and Africa. So a critical issue for the scientific method is not just making observations and trying to come up with explanations for those observations, but this idea of a hypothesis, that the explanation you come up with should make predictions. It should actually extend beyond the observations that were the basis of your explanation in the first place. Okay. And sort of central to the idea of continental drift is there is an ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, today in a place where there didn't used to be one, say 200 to 250 million years ago when all the continents were joined together across it. So what happened to that? Where did that ocean come from? You sort of have to come up with some prediction that oceans can be created. Okay? And we don't really think that the planet is getting bigger with time. So if you create an ocean in one place, if you're creating a new surface feature that's covering up a substantial area of the planet, well, you probably have to get rid of some surface area in another part of the planet just to keep the planet the same size. And so not only do you have to create an ocean, but you also have to get rid of crust somehow elsewhere on the planet. Okay? And at the time of Wegener's hypothesis, we just didn't know much about what was going on underneath the ocean. We knew very little about the shape of the ocean, except near ports and such places where a ship might run aground, and so there is a natural interest in mapping out the ocean depth. And so the experiments, the data to really formulate a complete theory weren't there. Okay? So at the time Wegener was doing his work, we didn't know enough about the ocean to really come up with a plausible explanation for where the oceans might come from, for instance, where a new ocean basin might come from and where an old 
ocean or continent might go, might disappear to. It seems kind of strange to have tens of kilometers of oceanic crust or a continental crust even thicker just go away, disappear somehow, sink into the depths of the Earth. However, as the 20th century wore on, in particular events like Second World War, invention and use of submarines in warfare, and then of course the Cold War, nuclear submarines and other submarines that set out to get those nuclear submarines, sort of developed a much more acute interest in what exactly the bottom of the ocean looked like. And there are many other reasons for this too, but this is one particular example of military motivation leading to scientific progress. Okay. And so during World War II, during the Cold War, in fact, the United States and other countries put quite a bit of resources into f mapping out the shape and other properties of the ocean. And that turned out to give us some clues that we didn't have at the time we were evaluating Wegener's original hypothesis. And so what are these sources of information? Well, getting better information about the depths of the ocean, development of things like side scan, side scan sonar, or even just widespread application of normal sonar to map out the depths of the ocean are really important in that took time to accumulate, but there are some less direct methods that also give us important information, as it turns out. And one of the best ones that I'll come back to a few times over the course of the next week or so is seismology. Okay, so we've already talked about the lithosphere as being this cold upper layer of the planet, right? It's cold, it's brittle, so it doesn't flow. If you put stress on the upper parts of the Earth, they can't just you know, flow away from that stress like if you were pushing through a pool or something like that and the water just flows out of your way. Instead, the lithosphere has to crack. Okay? And in that cracking process, when rocks move against other rocks, particularly if pressure is involved pushing those rocks together, that requires energy. And some of that energy, when rocks break and move, actually gets released as seismic energy, as earthquake waves. Okay? So we can imagine we have a fault so here's a nice tree. Here's the ground surface on the other side of a fault. In this case, this is a fault where the left side is moving up, the right side is moving down. In geology, we would call this a normal fault. And when an earthquake happens, when there's a sudden movement of the Earth's surface, it's a noisy process. And it gives off not just noise that you can hear if you're close to the earthquake, but it gives off noise that's bound within the rocks of the Earth's crust and then radiates out. And so if we have an earthquake here, there will be seismic waves that radiate outwards. They aren't quite perfectly circular, but to first order, we can think of them as radiating outwards. Okay? And you can think of this as being sort of like in a dark room, okay? and you're hooked up with a camera, and every time you bump into somebody, you hit the flash. Okay? And then for a second, you can see what is going on in the room, and then it goes dark again. Okay? And over time, if there are enough people walking around with flashes and they bump into each other often enough, you're going to get a reasonably good picture of who's in the room. Similarly, by tracking how the waves, how the energy from earthquakes travel through the Earth, we can actually get a picture in some detail of what the internal structure of the Earth looks like. Okay, here's a bit more detailed explanation of the same idea. So here we have planet Earth. This is just a kind of classic NASA digital image with all the clouds removed. And here's a cutaway. So we're seeing down into the, towards the center of the Earth. Okay, so here's the core mantle boundary. This is the mantle and then the crust up here. And let's just imagine in this case, I put this image together kind of quickly. I didn't really think about it that hard, but let's imagine we have a really big earthquake in northern Finland which northern Finland is not really a very seismically active place, but let's pretend there's a big earthquake there. Okay? And the waves are radiating outwards. Well, when a wave encounters something that has a very different wave speed, okay, if it goes from something where the wave speed is slow into something that the wave speed is fast, part of that wave's energy will be reflected. Okay, that's what happens when wave hit, waves hit something through which they travel differently. When I'm speaking, or if you're at a canyon and you you know, yell against the echoing wall and you get the echo back, that echo is a partial return of your sound energy because sound travels very differently through the rock than it does through the air. Okay? Similarly, 
the seismic energy traveling through the Earth, its path is going to depend on how quickly and what the properties are of the rockets traveling through. Okay? And in particular, in the Earth, it turns out that as you squeeze rocks more and more closely together, seismic speeds get faster and faster in general. Okay? Temperature's getting hotter. That tends to make seismic speeds slower. But overall, for most of the Earth, speeds get faster as you go deeper. And that tends to cause the waves to bend, a process called refraction that we'll get to later when we start talking about ocean waves. But of particular interest is when they reach a boundary in the Earth between properties that have materials that have very different properties. So between the Earth's rocky mantle and the metallic core, there's a very big change in density, and you're going from a solid in the mantle to a liquid in the case of the outer core. You can get waves that bounce off, and you can get waves that get bent through that boundary. They refract into the boundary. Okay? And so what you can see is if we trace out the paths of waves through the Earth from an earthquake, again, in northern Finland, which is not perhaps the most realistic place to put a big earthquake, nonetheless, in this particular case, what you can see is there are waves that just barely skirt the core that make it up to the surface here. But any wave that gets into the core gets bent when it reaches that boundary because of the different speed properties of seismic waves traveling through the mantle and core. It ends up taking a path like this. Then it gets bent again when it reaches the core mantle boundary on the other side and ends up coming out down here. So there is this range on the Earth's surface in the southern hemisphere for this particular earthquake in which the earthquake is basically silent. Okay? You don't actually get direct seismic energy. The waves that only make it through the mantle all come up in this part of the planet. The waves that go through the core all come up in this part of the planet. And in between, there's a shadow zone. Okay? And from that shadow zone, if you have enough seismometers, you can infer that there must be some layer deep in the Earth with different seismic speeds. And in fact, this is one of the leading pieces of evidence for the presence of a core okay, in the Earth and its size. Okay? We can figure out how big the core is if we can make some inferences about what the seismic speeds are going through the Earth. And we can infer the structure in much more detail than that, of course. We can look for faults. We can look for boundaries between crust and mantle. We can look for boundaries within the mantle itself. And the basic idea is to record seismic energy at as many places as possible around the Earth's surface. Okay? And this is kind of, your book has a very similar picture to this, I think. This is just a USGS free image of a, a cartoon of a seismometer, which is basically designed to measure the shaking of the Earth at a particular spot in the Earth's surface and record it in some way. Well, of course, we live in the computer age. We don't use weights and chart paper so much anymore. So this is actually a picture of a more modern seismometer Looking down on it from above, they look like little canisters, kind of, or actually a little bit like a garbage disposal. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but they do look a little bit like a garbage disposal to me. And you can see in here that there are actually a couple of uh, instruments to measure acceleration and displacement. And they're oriented, in this case, like this, and in this case, like this, okay? so to get the x and y direction of motion. And there's actually another one that's oriented in and out of the screen here, so you can measure all three directions of motion from a seismic wave and infer as much as possible of the information about where it came from. And it turns out that this technology is not just useful for measuring the structure of the Earth. It turns out to be nice for protecting your hard drive from getting busted. And so most modern computers, or most modern laptops at least, have built-in accelerometer chips that you can hack. So in this case, my laptop actually has a three-dimensional accelerometer chip built in. And this is a piece of freeware you can get that will actually record or display the readout from that chip. And so what you're seeing here is the acceleration of my computer in three different directions, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, z-axis being up and down in this case. Okay. And not much is happening. You can actually see a little slightly wiggly black line there and there. But if you disturb space a little bit, you can see that it records that acceleration very nicely. And in fact, they came in over the summer and they braced this. It used to be kind of loose, and so it used to be that I could jump up and down and make it go, but I don't think I can do that anymore. Oh, a little bit. Okay. So you can imagine if an earthquake happened right now, okay, we would actually be able to watch in real time the motions of that earthquake. 
Let's hope that doesn't happen, but nonetheless. And anybody who has a Mac, you can download this from free. Just look for a size Mac. And if you have an iPhone or an iPod Touch, they also have accelerometer chips in them. That's how it figures out which direction you have it so it can turn the screen. OK. So one of the really critical pieces of information that gives us a hint about plate tectonics, about what's happening to make continents move over the surface of the Earth and what's happening to the oceans that are being created in between them, is just mapping out, projected to the surface of the Earth, where are earthquakes occurring on Earth, OK? And this is a fairly recent catalog, but the particular time period doesn't matter very much. This is just something that was easy to find on the web. And so what we're seeing here are large earthquakes over the past eight or nine years, from 2000 to 2008. These are earthquakes of magnitude five or larger. They're pretty big ones. They're ones that if you were close by, you would feel a lot of shaking. And you can see that okay, these are not distributed randomly across the Earth's surface. Hopefully that's pretty clear just by looking at the map. That in fact they tend to trace out these linear arrays crisscrossing the Earth's surface. And there's some more information on this map, which is the depth at which the earthquakes are occurring. The red earthquakes all occur at depths that are less than 50 kilometers below the Earth's surface. The sort of greenish colors are maybe a few hundred kilometers deep. And then, the, sorry, the yellowish colors are a few hundred kilometers deep. And then the green ones are as deep as 700 kilometers below the Earth. And what you can see is, for the most part, earthquakes on the Earth are shallow. OK, that's the vast majority of them. OK, those reddish colors. They're within 50 kilometers of the Earth's surface. Actually, by and large, they were within 20 kilometers of the Earth's surface. That's typical for California earthquakes. They mostly occur within roughly 50 kilo 15 kilometers of the Earth's surface. Okay. Why? Why don't we have earthquakes that are deeper than that for most of the Earth? Okay, that's actually that's, that's part of it. So. The difficulty of moving rocks past each other to make an earthquake, okay, that's going to depend on the friction between them, right? The more friction there is, the harder you have to push them to make them go. And friction is, in some sense, proportional to pressure pushing them together. So the deeper in the earth you go, the more effort it's going to take to move things. Eventually, if you get really deep in the earth, it gets really hard to move things past each other. That's somewhat of the explanation, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. But that's definitely logical, and it's true to a certain extent. Yes. That's exactly right. So it's a, fundamentally, earthquakes come from rocks sliding past each other. That's a, a brittle process. Okay? It's not flow. It's a crack and things moving across the crack. Right? So that's going to happen in the part of the Earth where it's rigid, where things can't flow. Okay? If you're in a part of the Earth that's hot enough that it can flow, before enough stress builds up to make the rocks move past each other, given the higher pressure in particular, they're going to flow past each other instead. Okay? And you won't get an earthquake, you'll just get continuous deformation, plastic deformation. Okay? So for most of the Earth, earthquakes are happening in the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the shallowest part of the Earth, so by definition they're going to happen pretty close to the surface. So that actually makes sense. The more interesting question perhaps is why is it in some parts of the planet there are in fact earthquakes that are more than 100 kilometers deep? Okay? Lithosphere is only about 100 kilometers deep. How do you get an earthquake that's happening deeper than that? Well, let's take a closer look. So what we're looking at here is a map of the Western Pacific Ocean. Here's Japan. It's actually hidden under a bunch of earthquakes again. They're color coded just like before by depth, although the scale is a little bit different. But again, in this case, red is very deep earthquakes, and blue and green and yellow are shallow earthquakes, so the color scale is a little bit inverted. Sorry about that. Okay, so here's Korea, the Korean Peninsula. Here's Manchuria. Here's Russia or Siberia and Vladivostok, Kamchatka up there. And this is one of the parts of the Earth where we have this, a line of earthquakes. Actually, there's a split. There's another line of earthquakes going this way. And this is one of the parts of the Earth where we have deep earthquakes, earthquakes that are below 100 kilometers or so. And in fact, you can see that there are a number of earthquakes getting down to 300 kilometers, even 500 kilometers over here, and a few that are even down close to 700 kilometers. So, 
once we zoom in a little bit better, you can see that there's actually kind of a pattern here, that the earthquakes to the east are generally shallow, and the farther west you go in this part of the Earth, the deeper they get. Okay? So it's like there's a trend. The farther to the west you go, the deeper the earthquakes get. And in fact, if we make, oops, can you not see it here? Hang on one second. So sorry about that. There's supposed to be a little cross-section sign. So if we make a little cross-section, okay, if we just draw a line from here to here and plot along the distance of this line how deep are the earthquakes occurring, we get a picture like this. Okay. And the interesting thing is that right about here, there is a deep sea trench, okay, one of those areas characteristic of active margins where there's very deep ocean crust. Okay, and it's also a location where there are lots of earthquakes right near the surface. But as you go farther west past that trench, underneath, in this case, an ocean, but over here actually towards a continent also, the earthquakes get progressively deeper and deeper as you go down. Okay? And so I've asserted that earthquakes are brittle deformation. You should only see them in places where there is brittle rock. And rock is usually only brittle if it's fairly cold. Okay? But of course, as you go deeper in the earth, things generally get hotter because there's heat from radioactivity escaping all the time. So how do you get cold stuff hundreds of kilometers deep in the earth? If it's cold and it's deep, can you infer where it used to be? It used to be near the surface, because that's where cold things are on our planet. Okay? So we can infer that this stuff, whatever's here, a few hundred kilometers underneath Japan, okay, used to be at the surface. Okay? So we have not just information about temperature here, we have information about evolution with time, right? This used to be up here. And so we can turn that around and infer a direction. That there is, in this case, this is oceanic crust and lithosphere, and it seems to be going down this way. So we can infer there is oceanic crust actually being recycled, being subducted, being brought down beneath the, another part of the Earth's lithosphere into the deep parts of the Earth. Okay? And it's still staying cold because it takes rocks a long time to heat up. Rocks are kind of bad conductors of heat. So you can take a rock, big piece of it, shove it down into a hot part of the Earth. It's going to take millions of years to heat up. OK. So by the way, over time, what's this going to do? Okay. This is part of the Pacific Ocean over here. So this process is doing what to the Pacific Ocean as a function of time? It's making it smaller, right? You're taking some of the oceanic lithosphere of the Pacific and you're shoving it down underneath Asia. It's disappearing. It's going back into the Earth's interior. So here's a process by which oceanic crust and lithosphere is actually being removed from the Earth's surface, which was one of the questions we had about Wegener's hypothesis, right? OK, let's look at another piece of information. This one's a little bit complicated. I probably will go through it a couple times. So I'll try to remember to go through it again on Wednesday. So you'll get a couple tries at it. But feel free to stop me and ask questions if I'm going too fast. OK, so we've already talked about how things that can flow convect. When you heat something up, in general, it becomes less dense. Less dense things like to rise on top of more dense things. OK, this is true in the Earth's mantle. We saw some little movies of that, right? Hot parts of the lower mantle rising up towards the surface. That's what, in part, causes volcanism at mid-ocean ridges. But that's also true of the Earth's outer core, which is liquid iron metal with some other things mixed into it, nickel and a light element yet to be determined. And that's actually really runny stuff, OK? It's really liquid. So it can convect really fast. And you have a conductor, molten iron, Okay. circulating, and when you move conductors, you can actually generate magnetic fields. And that's exactly what happens inside the Earth. Our outer core, in particular, generates by convection a magnetic field. For our, from our perspective at the Earth's surface, we actually don't need to know the gory details, although it's a really interesting research problem. There are lots of people at UCLA and elsewhere working on it. Nonetheless, 
for our day-to-day -day experience, we can basically say, okay, it's as if we live on a planet that has a bar magnet buried in it, okay? And that bar magnet is pointed not quite exactly north-south, but fairly close to being north-south. I think the magnetic pole is somewhere in offshore Canada net today. And it's got a south pole pointing this way and a north pole pointing this way. This, this way, if you're walking around on the surface of the Earth with a magnet, the north pole is going to tend to point towards the north pole, towards the south pole of the Earth's magnet. Okay? That's why it's oriented backwards. Okay? But that's not all that happens. We actually have evidence that the Earth's magnetic field, because it's generated by convection in the Earth's core, is dynamic. It doesn't always have to be exactly the same. It changes with time. We can actually observe this. We've observed, for instance, that the Earth's magnetic field over the past 30 years or so has been weakening gradually. Okay? And if we go farther back in time, particularly about three quarters of a million years ago, there's pretty good evidence that it reversed. It used to be not that the South Pole was pointing this way and the North Pole was pointing this way, but the other way around. Okay? So your compass would point exactly the opposite direction from the way it does today. Okay? And in fact, this appears to have happened over and over again over the course of Earth's history that the, the Earth's magnetic direction flips every few hundred thousand years back and forth. And it's a more or less random process or stochastic. It's not like it's clockwork, okay? Sometimes it'll be one direction for millions of years without changing, and sometimes it'll flip back and forth really frequently. But the last major reversal was about three quarters of a million years ago. Okay. That may not immediately seem obvious to you is having relevance to understanding what's happening to the oceans as continents move around on the Earth's surface, to going from continental drift to plate tectonics. But let's see if we can draw a connection. Okay. So imagine we have a volcano. This is a picture, I believe, from Hawaii, but I'm not totally sure about that, from the US Geological Survey, of molten rock erupting at the Earth's surface. And of course, liquid rock, as it cools, it tends to crystallize. Okay, it becomes a solid, but atoms and molecules organize themselves into crystals with a repeating structure. And some of those minerals, in particular the mineral magnetite, but there are some other ones. Here's a picture of magnetite. It has a nice octahedral shape often. Is magnetic. Okay, many minerals are magnetic, magnetite in particular. And so if it crystallizes in the presence of a magnetic field, like the Earth's magnetic field, it's going to tend to orient itself with that magnetic field. Just like if you have two magnets sitting on your refrigerator, right? If you put them the wrong way to each other, they'll push each other apart. But if you put them north pole to south pole, they'll stick together. Okay? They tend to align their magnetic fields with each other. And crystals in rocks tend to also align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field at the time that they form. Or if you get them really hot, they actually start to flop around. So if you have a molten rock and it crystallizes and cools, at some point, the crystals are going to tend to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. And then as the rock continues to cool, that direction tends to get frozen in. It okay? gets stuck that way. It okay? becomes more or less permanently magnetized in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time it cools. Okay? But I just said that the Earth's magnetic field flips from time to time. So let's imagine that we have a boat, okay? and it's towing a magnetometer. And this magnetometer. They're actually fairly difficult instruments to make and make precisely, but it's fundamentally measuring something very simply. It's just measuring how strong is the magnetic field. Okay. Well, of course, it's going to measure the Earth's magnetic field, which you can sense everywhere. But imagine it's going over a part of the Earth's surface where the crystals were cooled below that temperature at which they freeze in when the Earth's magnetic field was pointed in the opposite direction from the way it's pointed today. Okay. Well, the Earth's magnetic field in this case might be going this way, but the crystals, they froze in the Earth's magnetic field when it was pointed in the opposite direction, so their magnetic field is pointed in the opposite direction today. Okay. So what's going to happen is that the Earth's magnetic field is going to be partially canceled by the magnetic field of all these crystals pointed in the opposite direction. And so you'll measure in net a weak magnetic field. Crystals don't have as strong of a magnetic field as the Earth overall. Okay? They just modify it a little bit in a local area. So they reduce it in this case because they're pointed in the opposite direction. And let's say the boat keeps cruising, and then it gets over a part of the Earth's oceanic crust that formed and cooled when the Earth's magnetic field was pointed the same way it is today. 
See? Well, in that case, the magnetic fields of the crystals point in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field, and they add together. And they make the local magnetic field a little bit stronger than it is in most places. And so the magnetometer registers a slightly strong magnetic field. Okay? So by dragging a magnetometer behind a vessel, you can infer whether the crust you're dragging it over formed at a time when the Earth's magnetic field was the same direction it is today or the opposite direction from what it is today. Does that make sense? This is basically, by the way, how a tape recorder works. Okay, so let's take in a, an example of a tape recording of the Earth's crust. And in particular, we're going to look at a classic area, one of the first areas that was looked at up here just southwest of Iceland. Okay, this is in the Atlantic Ocean, so we're going over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's a section of the ridge called the Reykjanes Ridge, like Reykjavik, which is the capital of Iceland, which is down here. So here's just a blow up. Here's the island of Iceland. Okay, and this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge going like this. And what you're seeing here in black and white is that magnetic recording. And in this case, the black colors indicate that that's a part of the oceanic crust that's giving rise to a particularly strong magnetic field. And the white colors indicate that that's a part of the oceanic crust that's giving rise to a particularly weak magnetic field. And the inference is this part of the crust, the stripe, okay, crystallized and cooled at a time when the Earth's magnetic field was pointed the same way it is today. In here, and in here, the Earth's magnetic field was pointed the opposite direction when those rocks crystallized and cooled. Following so far? So, again, if you look at this, it's clearly not random. It's not like oceanic crust magnetism is happening at random over time. There's a clear linear pattern to this, right? These magnetic stripes or magnetic anomalies are clearly oriented in the same direction that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is oriented. The modern location of the crest of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge corresponds to a region of strong magnetism. And as you go away from that center on either side, you have almost a mirror image uh, pattern of light and dark bands going away. Okay? So here we have strong, weak, strong, weak, kind of weak, strong, and weak alternations, then a big, strong one, big, weak one, big, strong one, weak one, and then we kind of run out of space over here. Okay? So, so it's like as, as you go away from the center of the ridge, you're getting a mirror image progression of normal and reversed magnetization of the oceanic crust. So how do we interpret that? Well, let's take a shot. We can go to where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is today and see that it's strong magnetization. Magneti it formed during normal magnetic direction. And we can go there and observe that there's volcanism happening. Okay? So we can infer that that stripe corresponds to stuff that's formed, crust that's formed over the last 780,000 years. Okay? It's all normal. That's the last time the Earth's magnetic field reversed. So that's the most recent oceanic crust. Then these white stripes on either side, we can say, okay, this formed during the last period of time in which the magnetic field was opposite in direction from the way it is today. Okay, and there's mirror image on either side. And then those strong black bands here and here, okay, that's the normal period before this one, and so on and so forth. Another reverse period, you could keep going outward from the center. Okay? And so the inference is that this mirror image from normal to reverse to normal to reverse going away from the center is a chronology. It's telling you relative ages with crust less than 780,000 years right here, older crust, still older crust, still older crust, still older crust. Okay. So over time, if we're making new crust, what's happening to the Atlantic Ocean? It's getting bigger. All right, we're getting somewhere, right? From looking at Japan, we found evidence from these earthquakes going down deep into the Earth and inferring from what we know about earthquakes being a property of cold material 
that there must be oceanic crust and lithosphere getting recycled, removed from the surface of the Earth. And here, southwest of Iceland, we have evidence from which we can infer that we have new oceanic crust and lithosphere being created with time at mid-ocean ridges. And so we've kind of gotten around Wegener's shortcoming, right? Now we can say, aha, we have evidence that in some parts of the Earth, oceanic crust is recycled. It's removed from the surface. And in some parts of the Earth, we create new oceanic crust and lithosphere. So that's a little bit much to, I guess, take down at once. So let's just take a break and see some movies about these things being formed. And so what we're going to show here are two. Hopefully they'll work. Oh, wait. Oh, no. They're not going to work. That's okay. I'll show these on Wednesday. I think I messed up loading them. Now I know what I did wrong. We'll see these on Wednesday, I promise. Okay. I just want to make the point here that it's not just at Iceland that you see evidence of new oceanic crust being formed at mid-ocean ridges and moving away. We are here, of course, in West Los Angeles. Here's a picture of the coastline of California going up to Monterey and eventually to San Francisco. And, of course, you see these light dark patterns in the form of stripes in the Pacific Ocean as well as in the Atlantic Ocean. Turns out we no longer have active mid-ocean ridges off the coast of Southern California, but we have evidence that there used to be ridges there. And if you go up a little bit farther north, Northern California, Washington, Vancouver Island, so British Columbia, you actually see evidence of exactly what we saw in Iceland, crust formed over the last 780,000 years that has strong magnetization and then a mirror image pattern of weak and strong and weak and strong going away from which we can infer that we have new oceanic crust and lithosphere being formed and progressively older crust and lithosphere as we get farther away from that region. Okay, so new oceanic lithosphere being created off the northwest coast of North America. Yes? Um, so one of the projects over the past 50 years or so has, of course, been to map out magnetic anomalies in the world's oceans. All of the large oceans have spreading centers in them. I think that's fair to say. And we'll get to the connection between oceanic crust and lithosphere being created or destroyed and active versus passive margins in a few minutes. There are small basins that don't have spreading centers in them, but the large oceans all do. Okay. So if we take that tape recording, normal, reverse, normal, reverse, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, okay, and back out from it how old individual parts of the oceanic crust have been, must be, okay, by trying to go back in time with terrestrial records of volcanoes and so on and date when exactly did these magnetic field reversals occur, we can actually make a map of the age of the Earth's seafloor. And remember, we just looked at a close-up up here, just south of Iceland, from which we inferred there was oceanic crust and lithosphere being formed today. Okay. And we also just looked at this area up here, where we also inferred from the magnetic patterns that there is new oceanic crust and lithosphere being formed today and then moving out to either side. And in fact, everywhere there is a mid-ocean ridge, we can find evidence from magnetic anomalies that there is new oceanic crust and lithosphere being formed. And the farther away from those ridges you get in the world oceans, in general, the older the oceanic crust becomes. It's not a perfect distance relationship, but it's pretty good. And there are some oceans, in particular the Atlantic, between North America and Europe or between South America and Africa, where there's almost a perfect mirror image pattern of age. Okay? There's a mid-Atlantic ridge running right up the middle of the ocean. Crust gets older and older and older until you get to the edge of the ocean basin. The Atlantic, uh, sorry, in the Pacific, it's not quite the case, right? There's actually quite young material up against the west coast of South America. It gets much older as you go towards the western Pacific. Okay. So let's go back 
and look at this again in light of what we've talked about for how scientific methodology works. Okay, so you need a hypothesis that makes predictions. Okay, and Wegener's idea made a lot of sense. It explained the data was there. It even made predictions that if you were, for instance, to map carefully other features of the continents on either side of the Atlantic Ocean, like in North America and Europe, you would find connections if you looked at rocks that were more than 250 million years old. Those held up by and large. But it didn't explain what was going on in the ocean. You somehow needed to create or destroy oceanic material, oceanic crust and lithosphere, or somehow move the continents over it. That didn't seem plausible. But now we actually kind of understand how that's happening, we think. Okay. So at the time of Wegener's hypothesis, we just didn't know enough about the Earth's seafloor to really test it, to see if it was plausible or not. But as we learned more about what was going on on the seafloor, both from measuring its depth, from measuring its magnetic properties, from measuring earthquake locations and depths on the Earth's surface, and to a certain extent by actually getting rocks from the oceanic crust and dating them, determining how old they are directly by radiometric methods, we've learned actually that there is very good evidence that oceanic crust and lithosphere are created in some places and destroyed in others, and in particular, they're being created in the Atlantic Ocean today, and there's evidence that the Atlantic Ocean is a relatively recent feature on the Earth's surface, only about 200 million years old, consistent with the idea that if you go back before that, North America and Europe, South America and Africa look like they were joined together. Okay? And what was critical was actually learning more about what was going on under the water. And this has been tested over and over and over again. One of the most convincing tests is now we have GPS. So if you have an iPhone or a fancy cell phone, it has a GPS receiver in it. We have slightly more sophisticated versions that you can actually install fixed to the ground that measure locations extremely precisely within a millimeter or less. Okay, and you can just leave them there for years at a time. And what we actually observe is that the continents are moving. We can see them moving in real time. I'll show you a picture of this on Wednesday. Okay. So pretty much everything we've thought of to throw at this problem, pretty much everywhere in the ocean near these mid-ocean ridges, you find evidence of new crust being generated. You find volcanoes. You find earthquakes, which are evidence of volcanic activity and other things, and so on and so forth. Okay. So continental drift was a very good idea. It just didn't explain what was going on under the water. And when we looked under the water, when we had that data available, we could formulate a hypothesis that made lots of predictions that have held up to the point where that hypothesis has now become accepted as a theory, the theory of plate tectonics. And over the next couple of lectures, we're actually going to go into this in much more detail and describe how this tells us about the history and the shape of the oceans, the continents, and the margins in between them. Okay. So. Plate tectonics is a theory. And it's important to realize that a scientific theory is not quite the same thing as a colloquial theory. Okay? You could say something like, I have a theory that if I put a raw egg in the microwave, it's going to blow up. Right? That's not really a scientific theory. That's actually a hypothesis. Okay? But in colloquial terms, people would understand what you're saying, right? Theory is kind of like a hunch or an idea, right, that maybe isn't fully formed, hasn't really been tested yet. In science, actually, theory is about as strong a base of knowledge as you can have. When we say something is a theory, that means everything we can think of to throw at it seems to hold up. It's been extensively tested. It explains a wide range of phenomenon. It's a really important idea for explaining how our natural world works. Okay? But in science, all knowledge is tentative. Theory is about as high a level as it gets, but even a theory can be overturned, or it can be modified. Okay, it can be improved. An example of this would be gravity. Right? The theory of gravity, who's responsible for the theory of gravity? Newton, right? 1600s and 1700s, he came up with this idea that masses attract each other. And for hundreds of years, people actually did careful experiments to figure out how that gravitational force worked what the laws were that governed it. Newton's ideas held up very well, but it actually turned out not to be the final word. Einstein came along in the 20th century and said, well, you have to be a little careful because gravity and time and space are actually related to each other in a slightly more complicated way than we think. And so we actually had to modify Newton's theory of gravitation to make it relativistic, 
to incorporate ideas of relativity that turn out to be important not for understanding why we aren't flying off into space. Newton's gravitation theory works just fine for that. But if you want to put a satellite in orbit around Jupiter very precisely, you actually need the best possible theory of how gravity works. And that includes incorporating the idea of relativity. So that's an example of a theory, the theory of gravitation, that's been modified over time. It's been improved okay, by additional information, by additional testing. Okay? Plate tectonics is somewhat like that. It's a very young theory. It hasn't been around for 400 years like gravitation. But as we go along, it's being tested. It's being improved. It's being modified. But the basic body of knowledge and the idea that it explains a large amount of what we observe at the surface of the Earth is persevering and is likely to persevere. All right. So a theory is a hypothesis that's been extensively tested and explains a lot of important stuff about our natural world. So theory is kind of the it. It's the bee's knees in science. Okay, to be associated with a creation of a theory is a really big deal. Not very many people actually get to do that. Okay. And I, I don't, can't remember if your, the latest version of your book talks about this, but there is discussion of scientific law in contrast to scientific theory. It's just a, a flavor of the same idea. I'm not going to draw a big distinction about that here. All right, so we'll come back on Wednesday and we'll learn more details about how plate tectonics explains the shape of the ocean.